years ago. I was on a, uh, some board, like an MTV board, where they uh, did this experiment where they would play classic hip hop albums for the, like their interns, who you know, of course, were like millennials. Um, so of course, you know, uh, of course, uh, you know, a De La Soul album won't translate as well as a Drake album will to someone born in you know 1999 or whatever. Um, and of course, in, in the, uh, the comment section, it was just, you know, a, a, a beat down. Uh, but the thing was, I was more disgusted at the people in the comments that were just uh, attacking the millennials. And my comment was sort of like, well, it's our job to educate them. Like, you mm -hmm. just can't assume that uh, the, the joy that you had discovering what this culture is all about is just going to resonate for generations to come. So... Um, we even like way back and like as, I think as far as like 2011, I think we sort of had the seed of wanting to have a platform to make make it educational, make it fun, and a deep dive, you know. So that's like just my personal uh, vested interest in, in this project. Okay. Black thought, can you weigh in? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree in that. Uh, you know, it's 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 not safe to assume that these stories. I mean, like it's we sort of take for granted because we we're immersed in it. Yes. So, um, and these these songs, the stories behind these songs, are also the stories of our lives. You know, so um, you know, from the in, from the inside looking out, so to speak, it's um it's easy to sort of uh, I don't know, just take it for granted. But you you can't assume that uh, that the world, or especially you know. The, the millennials um, are, are familiar with uh, with the story behind these iconic um, songs. Um, so yeah, so uh, th these are all stories that you know could stand to be to be told and retold and to be told in in greater detail. So um, you know, what better storytelling team than you know Questlove and myself and Jigsaw and Eric and one nine and Angie, um, I feel like you know, just on all levels, um, the the storytelling uh, was was a one. So you know, we came together and were able to just give, just like Amir said, a deeper dive, like a, a different sort of insight into uh, you know the origin story, the the DNA of of these songs that you know became the DNA of you know the eras in which they they sort of hit. How did you go about narrowing it down to six songs? I know everyone's favorite parlor game since I have been was introduced to hip hop years ago was top, top five MCs, top 10 hip hop songs of all time. And we spent hours debating that. Tell me that you all, I mean, I would imagine it was, there were passionate conversations, yeah, we, vigorous debate, some songs that you thought hours, should have been on the list and didn't make it. You said what? Hours, weeks. Um, and I want each of you to weigh in because I know Eric has some thoughts, One Nine has some thoughts. Yeah, I would say, um, well, you know, we, we looked at so many different factors, but there was always a common ground of authenticity and legacy, right? It was always about what do these songs mean in American history. Um, and so we really started with a blank canvas, really a blank board, and we just threw really our favorites up there. So, I mean, there is a list, and then I'll pull it out in a minute, but I think we started with... You can pull it out now. Um, <laughs> we started, we started, I mean, you guys remember, um, I mean, we, we, we threw PSK, Schoolie D out there, we threw Biggie out there, we yeah. threw... Yeah. I went to the map for uh, Schoolie D, which was sort of funny. It was one of those things you wouldn't expect that you would do. Why is that funny? <laughs> no, I guess it's not funny, but it's uh, because I came, so of this team, I did not grow up in a hip-hop environment. So, uh, so a lot of this was, um, you know, and I think it's one of the things that's very cool about the show is that it can appeal to really anyone. But, um, but yeah, it was that I just became a little bit obsessed with Schooly D. I just think he's incredible. <laughs> but was there a litmus test where you like, oh, this song doesn't make me shake. It's a mild quiver, so it doesn't make the list. How did it's called? Well, the songs that well, shook America. I don't think people know that. Well, I mean, not everyone knows that the, sort of the impetus of the project is based on Shea Serrano's uh, book, right. uh, the Rap Yearbook, and of which he, you know, everyone has their subjective opinion, what they think is the ultimate, you know, hip-hop song, whatever, and he chooses a song a year. 
we didn't necessarily want to be that, but we sort of knew and we hoped that the viralness of this program goes far, you know, the ripple goes far on social media as far as people, uh, you know, having debates and whatnot, what they feel is important. But I think at the end of the day, um, we chose, because a lot of people thought, well, 1989, obviously it's going to be Fight the Power, right? But right. You know what I mean? And that song figures and that song figures so prominently throughout the entire series. I was surprised to not see well, it make I mean, the list. There's going to be hopefully other seasons as well. Oh. So this isn't this isn't just the end, but uh, another six. Well, I mean, uh, hopefully a, a full season. I think we just kind of wanted to put it, uh, just a little appetizer out there. Do we have a season? Um, get a lot of good buzz on it, and then really come with. Uh, come with what we want it because a lot of my favorite songs that I want to do I want to hold for season two and season three like not just go out the gate from the from the top so yeah. this is yeah, just just an appetizer Eric you jump in here we go way back to our days of writing for yeah. Vibe magazine Rolling Stone yeah. so New York good. Times so yes. what so, songs were you advocating for that either made it made the cut or didn't necessarily Make it. I, I think, you know, just to give you a background about how these songs came about, um, I think starting off with the ground of the rap yearbook was the starting point, was the jump off. But we look at those songs that Shay picked in the rap yearbook, and that was meant to be a debate, and we had that debate behind the scenes. And anybody, top, like you mentioned, top five, get her alive, that kind of debate. But we had, to, and we used to have that debate saying, who's your favorite? Who's the best? And I had that all my life. Right. You know, Chris Rock made a, a movie called Top Five. <laughs> right. All my life I've had this debate. And it starts to get a little bit old. I mean, you have to say, you start switching them around in some order at some point. Depending on who you talk to, if you want to be antagonistic, you start changing it up. Yeah, you start yeah. saying, and you, you agree with no this particular person. order. Yeah. Yeah. Or you agree with this person, but just so you can have the debate, you know. <laughs> you throw a red man in there just to have the debate. <laughs> so what we did, we got, we got in the room and we talked about Really, the criteria is um, the impact it could have, the story it could tell, and then there's this unseen thing that has to do with uh, a reality check, when you have a come to Jesus moment about the songs you pick. Because to be quite honest, if you go behind the scenes, sometimes you can't clear a song. Sometimes um, a song might clash because it's not in the right, for the particular, this particular season, we want to represent geography, we want to represent uh, time periods, we want to represent different messages that was in that was in the music, so we tried to mix it up a little bit because we only had six, so we had to mix it up with those things in mind too. Yeah, I think it's just that when we started, once you know we we started to take into consideration sort of the broader stroke that we wanted to make and separate you know self and you know just be less emotional, um, then yeah we were able to to sort of select the, the six songs that we we wound up with. But, um, yeah, very many, you know, knock down, drag out, you know what I'm saying, hours of, of debate. We, geography played, played a big key in yeah. decades because, yeah. you know, we didn't want to seem very East Coast centric. Initially, we had a very East Coast 80s, 90s eras, and we said, you know, we have to spread it out. So we you know, brought in the 2000s, we brought in the South, we brought in the West Coast, and women in hip hop. So, I mean, those all were like really set the tone of what we needed to. to and then we started, you know, what's the best West Coast song? What's the best Southern? And then what's the best story? What's the best impact? So those are. And we started, you know, well, West Coast, like, you know, rap was based on Schooly D. So we should, you know, went back to our. Comes back to Schooly yeah, D. Yeah. <laughs> all things come tie, tie back into. The, they did not have a Philly bias at all. <laughs> there was no Philly bias in this. <laughs> no. He says with a hint of sarcasm. You know, I want to dive into this episode, but before we do that, can we talk about how you brought this project to AMC? Did they come to you and say, we were looking for something like this? Did you go to them and say, this is something that we're thinking about and, and this is what we want to do? Was there room for this on AMC? How did that come to be? I think we just, I mean, we put feelers out there. Um, and have various meetings with different uh, networks and whatnot, streaming services. And I think at the end of the day, AMC really gave us the, not just the autonomy, but the power to 
uh, have like the final say and and really complete our vision because you know it's also this is also not not a hard sell but the way that we presented it was I mean for me yeah what was the pitch for me it was like okay so I'm not a sports guy but I love ESPN's 30 for 30 yes. and you know I've seen all those episodes and you know I'm obsessed with it and that's what I wanted this to be like I'm not a guy that I mean if it's my hometown or something or you know for sports yeah I'm all involved or a playoff thing but you know for me to get as engaged as I was with ESPN's 30 for 30 that's what I want this show to be for people that really didn't grow up in that in that particular uh era that they're watching, no matter what year that we chose. And um, and on top of that, uh, just me in general, just as a, a nerd, I want to know every aspect of the story from, I want to know the story of who they sampled and their story, and if that leads to a deeper dive, and let's go there as well. So, there, I mean, there's some episodes where it's like the from my favorite episode is actually the 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 bridge wars between uh, oh, wow. Karras and 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 Marlon Wall. Just the breakdown of the whole Honey Drippers and Peach the President sample and how that's affected hip hop. That to me is like really special. But you know, just with the music and with the lyrical content and its effect and after effect, and AMC was really just willing to let us do that because I think. With anyone else, it was like, well, we don't want to sort of bore them with, you know, nerd facts. Like, just get to the grid, talk about, you know, that sort of thing. And AMC really just allowed us to do what we felt was needed. Now, yeah. Angie, I know earlier you were telling me about how this was, these six episodes were shot in less than a year. How did, how did you pull that off? I mean, logistically, that must have been completely overwhelming. You did I mean, it. it was, but... uh, we had a lot of fun with it, I think. Um, you likened it to it a was, giant puzzle. Yeah, it was Tetris. like a game of Tetris. Um, because I do think one of the things that's unique and kind of amazing about the series is that the song uh, that, it's, that is at the heart of it, you're going to hear throughout the episodes. And a lot of the time you'll hear individual tracks. And so you really, by the time you watch the episode, you feel like you know that song inside and out. And, um, but what that means is you can't just take out the song if you can't clear it. The entire episode is that one song, and it's a very long process. So I think for all of us, it was, you know, there was the big board with all the songs. There were some that would go into the graveyard because we ran into an issue and we knew that we couldn't get that there. Um, you know, we would sometimes have backup songs if something didn't um, pull through. So it was definitely, um, and it was also getting the people to interview. It's something that, you know, when Eric and One Nine came on board, um, after it went to series, the concept or the execution of it adjusted so much. I mean, these guys have such an incredible vision that it was really an honor to work on that. And I think one part of that is making sure that the people who are telling the story are the people who were there. You know, you could book really quickly people who could talk about these songs, but weren't a part of it. And I think trying to execute it in a way where it was really the six or seven key storytellers, which was what they wanted to do, I think made all the difference. But yeah, it was a little bit tricky, but I think we made the most of it. Uh, Eric and One Nine, talk to me about how you went about sourcing this archival footage how you went about finding all of these unsung heroes that feature so prominently throughout the series? Um, I mean, when we first started, you always look at what the story is, which, just what the core story is, and then you, want, you discover so much more as you really go through. Um, one of my favorite episodes is the Jesus Walks episode where we were able to find uh, Curtis Lundy, who was the leader of the ARC choir, and they were all former drug addicts, and they created the original walk beat with the version that became the sample. But we, we didn't know who he was. We, you know, we discovered all of this as we're learning and filming and shooting up in Harlem. And it just became a, a self-discovery. So we want to, you know, and those open up the stories even deeper. So. And for those who aren't familiar with that episode, Curtis Lundy was, is a, ja 